on Neolithic art. And what we're going to see in this lecture is that not only was the Neolithic period an important time in the development of megalithic, large-scale stone architecture, which was the topic of the first video of this series, we're going to see that it's also a rich time of art production in terms of sculpture and painting. And this is going to be a shorter lecture. I'm just going to show you two examples of each two sculptures and two paintings. Now we're going to start with an Anatolian sculpture from the site of Chatal Huek. And there's some debate as to who it is that we may be looking at. Now some this figure is a goddess, which you can see from the title. However, there's very little known about Anatolian religion. So to me personally, Identifying this sculpture as a depiction of a goddess makes me just slightly uncomfortable because it touches upon this trend in art history that thankfully has started to go away. Where in the past, most sculptures that depict women are just automatically identified as goddesses, which takes away from the possibility that mortal women could have been powerful and could have made a contribution to their society. Now, if we want to start out with the goddess angle, one of the th reasons why I think that scholars go this route is because of the two lion heads that we see on either side of the chair upon which this woman sits. Now these could be the goddess's sacred animals. These also could have been symbolic of protection, which is a pretty common iconographic meaning cross-culturally. And with each of her hands on a lion's head, it would certainly imply that she has mastery over the, the natural world. And these are two common goddess um, occupations, so to speak, is to protect people, but then also to control the natural forces. Now let's entertain the possibility that this woman was a human being and not a goddess. So first, I'd like to note that there's that depict women. They're heavy set, they have large breasts that are weighted down by gravity, and hair is tied back. Now some scholars have made an interesting observation that the sagging of the breasts and the belly may indicate that the figure is elderly, that she's an older person, and that the reason why we see an elderly woman depicted in art, which by the way, just her depiction alone indicates that she would be important because everyday people like you and I, we wouldn't have images made of herself. So just that she exists would be an indication of her importance. But then we see her seated on this badass throne with lions on either side, and that definitely could convey importance and power as well. And we do know that within the, the society of Chatal Huek, that women were prominent in this culture, and especially elderly women, women, because they were seen as having wisdom and experience, and that granted them these positions of power. Now, this theory has been supported by archaeological evidence. Of the figures, the sculptures discovered at Chatal Huek, in terms of those, a number of them are women. And in comparison to the sculptures, the fewer sculptures that depict men, the sculptures of the women are much more elaborate. So more care was invested in creating their images, and this also is a reflection of importance. Now this is our second example of Neolithic sculpture. This one is from a site near Amman in Jordan. And this site was occupied from the late 8th through the late 6th millennium BCE. What we see here is one of over 30 sculptures of a similar style and type, and they were found distributed among two pits. And perhaps what's going on here is that these figures were ritually buried within these pits. We're not really sure why they were created, um, and this is a mystery that's even more pronounced because none of the figures indicate gender. Now there's been some discussion about them relating somehow to human burial. In your readings, you're going to learn about who covered the skulls of their deceased with plaster. 
And then they inlay the skull's eye sockets with cowrie shells, which is the exact same thing that is happening with these Jordanian sculptures. So what they did is they made a core out of like tightly bundled sticks or reeds, and then they applied plaster over that. And then for articulating the eyes, cowrie shells. So there's a clear material link that exists between the Jordanian figures, such as the one we see here, and then these skulls that were produced in Jericho. Also, like the people of Jericho, and this also was true with Chatelhuek, these people, the Jordanians, they also buried their dead under homes as well. So all three had similar funerary traditions. Now, despite these compelling similarities, this idea of the sculptures related to human burial is a little questionable to me because the people, the actual people, weren't buried in groups the way that these sculptures were. Remember, there was a lot of them found distributed between two pits. And when you look at them, they appear very lifelike. And that's seen, for example, again with the eyes, but they have the pupils painted in to really emphasize the fact that the eyes are open. Many of the sculptures were painted with clothing on it, which is a pretty everyday thing. And so if anyone wants to know my educated guess, I'm wondering if these are votive figures, which are often found in groups. And votive figures, they can represent individual people, which would explain why so much effort was invested in making these figures relatively unique. And then the idea of the votive figure is that they are given as an offering to a god or a group of gods. The mystery really remains uh, surrounding these figures. Now there's one other detail to mention, and that's the size of the sculpture, approximately three feet five inches. Now when you think about the many little sculptures that we were looking at from the Paleolithic period, like for example the woman or the Venus from Willendorf was just 4.5 inches tall, which is a lot smaller than what we're seeing here. This makes the size different noticeable. And what's really exciting here is this is indicating with this size, 3 feet 5 inches, the very beginning of what will become monumental sculpture in the Near East. All right, so let's move on to cave paintings. Now you are already familiar with cave paintings because we talked about the Paleolithic approach in a previous lecture. They did not stop creating um, the people, human beings, did not stop creating cave paintings when the Paleolithic period ended. We see this art form continuing on into the Neolithic period. Now, if you look at the two side by side, we can see that even though they're cave paintings, that pretty much the similarity is going to end there. There are notable differences, four of them, which we need to note. Now, the first one has to do with location. Can you recall from the Paleolithic lecture where we most commonly find the cave paintings? And if you can't recall, why don't you pause this video, go back and look in your notes. Practice reviewing, practice being familiar with uh, what you've got in your notebook, and then come back. So hopefully you did that. And what you found when you looked back in your notes, or maybe you have a really good memory and you remembered it off the top of your head, was that the Paleolithic cave paintings were found in the back, the back of the cave, hidden away, protected, it was a challenge to access them. And this is a very different situation with Neolithic period cave paintings because they were located in typically in the front of the cave, meaning they were accessible, they were in a place where people could see them. So location is one difference. Now this leads into our second difference, which is function what the paintings were used for. Now, there's a lot of different theories out there about why Paleolithic paintings were created. And I really do believe that they had 
some sort of religious connection. And I'm not talking about an institutionalized church-based belief, but this idea that the Paleolithic people believed in a higher power or they believed in forces that were mysterious, stronger than them, and some kind of spirituality, something along those lines. So I'm just going to say religious because that's kind of the easiest way to put it. And the, the theory that I really like to stick with is the hunting magic theory. That idea that these were made to assist people in successful hunting. Now, what we think is that with the Neolithic period, their cave paintings function was narrative. And what narrative means is they told a story. Now, if I can pause for a minute, I want to bring in our third difference, which has to do with subject matter, because this relates. So with Paleolithic cave paintings, the primary subject matter was animals, right? Animals, 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 with com comparatively very few references to people. In the Neolithic period, it's far more frequently depictions of people. This is not to say they never painted animals, because we see some right in here. But instead, we do see mostly it's people. Now, if we can go back to the narrative function, then the idea is that these might be recounting events. Uh, they might be recording history. The point is they seem to be recording some kind of human related activity or occurrence. Now, if you think about the lifestyle of the people of the Neolithic period, this makes sense. People are staying in one place for longer periods of time. And so what's happening is there's a lot more social interaction. This is going to become an increasingly important part of the lives of the people back then. And this is what's being recorded in the painting. So our three so far differences is we have a difference in location, a difference in function, and a difference in subject matter. Now our fourth difference is there is a difference in sophistication. These paintings are incredible, super realistic. Even back in the Paleolithic period, artists are understanding formal elements such as implied depth with vertical placement and overlap being used simultaneously to insinuate four receding planes of space. We have this beautiful, subtle gradation of tone to suggest the fully rounded, implied three-dimensionality of these horses. And this is amazing. This is some of the earliest artwork ever made by a human being. And this is what they're coming out with right away. It just blows my mind every single time. Now over here, these are pretty much stick figures. And even like with the treatment of space, it's really ambiguous. This does not have the level of detail and sophistication as what we're seeing here. Now, this is actually kind of rare in the history of art because as time goes on, what we typically see is that art improves, that artists draw from the techniques and the knowledge of their predecessors and then approves upon it. But here, it's almost like art's going as why. The answer I propose is that the paintings had a different relationship to the people. These paintings, especially if we're subscribing to, for example, the hunting magic theory, these paintings are for their very survival. And so they're going to be very special. They're going to have a lot of care and time and energy invested into them because they help make their life successful. They help them live, which is kind of a thing. Now over here, they might not need painting so much because they have their domesticated animals. They have their crops. They are still hunting, but it's not quite as uh, critical for one's survival. And so maybe, first of all, they're now spending all this time. But second of all, maybe they don't feel that they need to. And let's end with a second painting. This one is also another work of art from Chatal Huek, just like our seated supposedly goddess figure from the beginning of the lecture. So we're coming full circle. And um, what we can see here with this painting 
is it's very much in line with the other types of paintings that were generated during the Neolithic period. Again, we have a treatment of space that is nondescript. The human figures are essentially stick figures, and the humans make up a noteworthy portion of the subject matter. Now, what we see here has been interpreted as a hunting scene, and this is not atypical. There were numerous paintings that came out of this site that we could describe as being violent and wild. There's some with like people without heads to show that perhaps they were decapitated, uh, not by other people, but by animals. So a really interesting study on the relationship between humans and animals during this time and in this place. Now through formal analysis, we can get a sense of the action and the tension and the energy involved in a hunt. And that is seen with all of the diagonal lines that we find throughout the composition. And we can get a sense of the raw power of the animals through their scale, their size, as compared to that of the people. Paintings such as these remind us that just because we start to see the domestication of animals, it doesn't mean that hunting completely stops. It's still an important part of sustenance. But what I want to put out there, something for you to keep on your radar, is what we're going to also see as soon as our, our next lecture on Mesopotamia, we're going to start to see that it also becomes hunting an important expression of power and masculinity. And these are ideas that may have had their origin in images such as these.